Hello from AGO's iconic Galleria Italia. No, this is not a screenshot behind me. I'm really in Galleria Italia. I wish you could all be with me, hopefully another time soon. I am Erin Prendergast, Chief of Staff and Head of Strategic Initiatives at the Art Gallery of Ontario. I am pleased to be joined by Jennifer Hollett, the incoming Executive Director of the Walrus Foundation, home of Canada's conversation. I also acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Haudenosaunee, and was also the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Neutral, and Seneca Nations. Thank you everyone for joining this conversation. I hope you are all keeping safe and well. A few quick housekeeping matters to get out of the way before we get started. You are all muted and we can't see you, aw, but please feel free to ask lots of questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Send us your questions. We really want to make this fun and interactive and hear from you. So here we go. Jennifer, in the words of your predecessor, Shelley Ambrose, I am thrilled out of my head to meet you and to hear about your vision for the walrus. The AGO and the walrus have a long history together. We have similar mandates of supporting artists and ideas and the AGO has hosted Walrus Live talks in the past. You, Jennifer Hollett, are a former broadcast journalist and entrepreneur and have extensive experience in public policy, including a degree from Harvard, politics, government relations, fundraising, media, and strategic communications. So what drew you to the Walrus and what will be your focus as we head into a new, already somewhat turbulent decade. Yeah, well, great to be here. I really miss wandering the city, especially art galleries like the AGO. So this, this feels second best. And yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting time to be starting a new role, especially such an exciting role like this. As incoming executive director, I've been working from home the entire time. And this, this is my normal, Zoom and, and Google Meet. And um, I was attracted to the walrus for its incredible range. I've always been a fan of the walrus's journalism. I have both attended the walrus talks as well as been a part of the walrus talks on stage. And, you know, I think it's, while a challenging time for journalism, it's also a really special time for journalism because we can tell so stories in so many different ways. And as you mentioned, my background, it's a nonlinear path, which I think is becoming more and more common these days. So I'm excited that I can bring my range of experiences from tech to traditional media, politics to policy, and, and really come into this role and put it all to use because the Waller started as a magazine, but now it's so much more and, and that's what we're hoping to do with Canada's conversation is spark conversations, but some of the most important issues of our time. Absolutely. Um, and I should say that the Walrus is, is known for being Canada's most honored magazine, but it also has a whole platform through talks, through digital activities, et cetera. But let's talk about the magazine for a minute. Sure. Can you please take us through a few pages of the new issue? Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is uh, I'll share s some of the art and stories in the new issue. And what's like just mind blowing is that the team has done this from home. So this issue, which is showing up in mailboxes, it's at newsstands that still are around in COVID, so at grocery stores, et cetera, because many newsstands you can't access right now because they're at airports or at, at stores that are, that are closed. Uh, but here we are, a print publication, and it's been put together by our incredible editorial team. So this is hard work, it's creativity, and it's pivoting, right? It's figuring out new ways to do things to tell stories. And this cover here was designed by Paul Kim, who is the design director for The Walrus. And I love the monochromatic theme. I think it really captures this moment in time. And I know for me, because this is the first issue that I'm on the masthead for, I'm always gonna look back this, back at this. It's not just the first, but just like, oh my gosh, COVID, like, wow. Like, 
that was unlike anything else, right? Like I'm, I'm already hoping to feel that way in the, in the future, even though I know we'll be with this for a while. So while COVID-19 is a big theme of this issue and the day-to-day -day journalism that we're doing at the walrus.ca, we're also covering other really important issues right now, topics and subjects that we can't forget about. So this is the cover story, your brain on COVID-19. And what I love about this piece is it understands like what's happening to us right now, because it's, it's such a different feeling than other challenges and crises that we've been through. And it's written by science journalist, Carolyn Abraham, and the illustration is by Cornelia Lee. And as you mentioned, Erin, the walrus does have a mandate to bring awareness to Canadian artists, both established and emerging. And what I love about this piece, and, and this is something, again, I get to step into, um, but when I used to just be a reader of The Walrus, I love that you can scroll through the website, that you can go through the magazine, and that the art, the illustrations, the photography, that they're telling the story, and they can kind of guide like, oh, I'd like to read this first, or I'm gonna come, come back to that. So this piece, I just wanna highlight uh, and read to you part of it, because uh, it really captures what I think a lot of us are trying to understand. So Carolyn writes, humans are not well designed for this slow burn brand of threat. We're better equipped for one-off attacks than abstract menaces. Give us muggers, hurricanes, saber-toothed tigers, hazards that compel us to battle or run for our lives, not the protracted uncertainty of a contagion that has killed tens and thousands and counting. So that's what this story is about. And you see it in the illustration here, that primal instinct. That is how I feel when I go to the grocery store. I go once a week, I put in my basket, I take a big deep breath and I am just, I am moving. Sometimes I think of something that I need, need over in aisle three. It's like, uh-uh, I'm in aisle 10. I can't, it's very, very primal what we're going through and the piece really gets into that. This is a story that looks at climate crisis refugees. And uh, it's set in Dadaab. Dadaab is one of the largest refugee camps in the world. It's in Northeastern Kenya. I've actually been to Dadaab uh, for a documentary that I did as part of a high school tour with Care Canada years ago. So I was very interested to see what Dadaab looks like now. And refugee camps are all about people and resilience. And the story is by Carolyn Thompson, the photography by Patrick Meinhardt, who is based in Nairobi. And it's, it's very colorful, it's, it's powerful, and it shows the strength of the people of this refugee camp. And it tells the stories of climate refugees, and we're gonna be hearing more and more about climate refugees. But just like, look at this, you just lock with the eyes of, of this young woman. And you can also see in the photos how difficult the lives are. So it's hard enough for a refugee to escape and then navigate a whole new set of challenges in a refugee camp. And the, the terrain in Dadaab is particularly difficult. And, and you can see that, that here. So this is a really important story and I'm glad that we're still telling it, despite the fact that we're, we're trying to unpack and understand COVID-19. In many ways, I think it's encouraging all of us to look at the climate crisis differently and how soon that can be impacting all of our lives in, in different ways. This is a story in the June issue about a, a cold case, uh, a murder in Nova Scotia from the past. And it's really a story that explores community and unanswered questions. And the photography really invites you, invites you in. And I mean, this piece here, the depth of field, uh, black and white photography, looking at that versus the color photography earlier. Um, you know, the, this, this piece, really shows how community can, can come together and, and how certain stories and cases are not forgotten and continue to be explored. And then this piece here, this is a, a profile on, on artist Margot Williamson. It's by Sophie Wheeler. And this art actually was done before COVID-19 yet yeah, it's very much in the moment because it's highlighting what's right in front of us, right? Like the table that I'm on right now, the chair that I'm sitting on. And I'll share with you, Aaron, and everyone is following at home, the opening to this piece. The names of the paintings in Margot Williamson's most recent series are as low key as their subjects, table and chair, window, 
living room, desk, bed. In painting ordinary objects, the Toronto-based artist brings a focus to the spaces in and around our homes that usually make up the background of our lives. And it's incredible because right now, those are the, those are the stars of my home, right? Like I'm now depending on all these everyday objects that I think in the past I've taken for granted. I live on my own. These are my friends right now. So I love that this piece invites us in taking a look at the inside, not only what's in this art, but also what's around us right now. So that's a little overview and, and look at the new issue. Thank you so much for that. And what a small world. Margot Williamson, if I'm not mistaken, I believe was, uh, is a former artist in residence here at the AGO. Oh. So uh, she's an artist that we're very familiar with. So thank you for letting us know about that work. So you were talking about the June issue. This is the May issue, which is uh, currently still on, on uh, the newsstands. And I know that because I have a puppy who chewed my <laughs> original copy to smithereens. And it's not the first time she's done that. She I really, think that's a compliment, right? I like, think it is. She yeah. just finds all my walrus magazines. And I, so I had to, I went to Shoppers Drug Mart to the newsstand and I got a new one. The story about the pandemic was incredible because it reminds us that really throughout humanity, we have regularly been faced with these pandemics and they're constantly something that we have to overcome. So if it gives us any comfort to know that, you know, humanity has been through this before and here we are still here. So we will find a way through that as well. So just talking a little bit more about magazines. Um, I grew up in a household of magazines. My dad was a teacher and, and high school basketball coach. So I was constantly reading his Sports Illustrated, incredible sports writing. I love Sports Illustrated. My mom was a nurse and, and wanted to make all of our homes very warm and inviting and to reflect her own taste and personality. So there was Chatelaine and Canadian Living and there were just magazines all over the place. So as a result, I grew up loving magazines. And as you know, and some other people might know, I used to work at the Walrus, so I'm now a Walry. So um, I just love, love, love magazines. Um, and I'm wondering if you could t tell us what are your thoughts on the future of magazines at this time? Yeah, so for me growing up, I also loved magazines and magazine subscriptions. I even had my own zine where I would put together through typewriters and friends art and actually cutting out mainstream publications to create my own independent magazine that I would trade through pen pals and sell at the local punk rock record stores in, in Niagara. Um, I, I think for me, magazines are like vinyl and now, I come from the record industry. I used to work at Sony Music on top of much music. And even though most of us listen to music like this now, right, through MP3s, there's yep. still a very loyal following and passion for records, for vinyl, right, for record shops. And that's how I see magazines. I think we're always going to have a group of people who really just want to like hold the magazine and, and get the avocado on it while they're reading it. Yeah, like, and, and that's really important. And, you know, we have a loyalty to those print lovers. We're seeing it with books as, books as well. So while the growth opportunity, more and more, it's gonna be on your phone, it's gonna be on your laptop, on tablets, it's gonna be audio, how we tell stories. I think there's always gonna be a place and space for magazines uh, in our libraries, right? In our archives. Uh, and it's really important that we, we protect that. So to me, I look at magazines like vinyl, which is, yep, we have new ways of, of telling stories that reach more people, but you're always gonna have people who just love that original, that print form, because uh, there are certain things that you can only do in, in, in a magazine or, or a filling. So that's, that's how I see it. It's, it's, it's like vinyl, you know? Some people, that's, they have to hear it on vinyl. That's a great, a great comparison. I love that. Um, at the AGO, we have an incredible library here uh, named after E.P. Taylor. And um, not only do we have one of the largest volume of art history books, but we've constantly got all the um, art related and art history and uh, magazines uh, that come into the AGO. And there is a public space once we reopen that anyone can come in to enjoy off the south entrance where a number of magazines are always on view and there's some really comfy um, furniture there. So just encourage people to come and check out the magazines at the AGO anytime. So now I'm going to take a moment to um, ask a couple of questions from our audience. So the first one is, Jennifer seems uniquely qualified to bring the walrus through the post-COVID world. 
do you have a large digital and virtual background? That's a great question because I know that you do. <laughs> yeah, so before this, I was working at Twitter as the head of news in government. And actually very early in my career, I mentioned I was at Sony Music. I was a manager of the new media department. So I've worked in, in tech and digital and all the different things that we've called it over the years. Uh, so that is just part of who I am and how I experience the world. And uh, Shelly Ambrose, the outgoing executive director, likes to joke, it's a perfect time for me to be starting, right? Because I'm very comfortable on Zooms and uh, I've set up live streeting for CBC and, and TVO and other partners working at, at, at Twitter. And uh, I get excited by what technology can do and how it can bring us together. So yeah, I, I'm ho hoping to take that experience and, and bring it into this role. And, and, and the team's already in it, right? That, that's the other thing is that um, while a lot of people do think of us as, as the magazine, more and more we are the walrus.ca. We also have a new podcast called The Conversation Piece. It's actually featured in Apple right now as a boredom buster. So I encourage people to check that out um, because we can, we can connect to each other through storytelling in so many different forms right now. Uh, social media, I mean, that's how our stories, stories travel. And for me, it's, it's all of the above, right? I like getting stories from a bunch of different sources and mediums. Absolutely. Um, there's another question about who designs the covers of the walrus. And I know you mentioned the name Paul Kim, who's amazing. Yes. Maybe you could say something about how Paul works with illustrators or artists to design covers of magazines. Yeah, so our, our design director, Paul Kim, sometimes does covers himself like this, but the art team also works with illustrators and artists uh, to commission covers. So it's different month to month, uh, but the cover is so important, right? The cover is how people decide which magazine they're gonna pick up in newsstands. Uh, it, it's also, um, part of the larger commissioning that we do for, for stories, right? The, the artwork and how people know that we have no journalism coming out. So I've been learning a lot being in cover meetings, discussing the colors and, and the themes, uh, but also too, you know, all of the, the bylines and, and the headlines and the, and the captions. So a lot goes into a cover. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned working at Sony, I think you mentioned that. You have a background working with musicians including at Much Music. How has music helped keep you calm um, during the pandemic? Erin, I love this question because for anyone who's worked in any type of industry, even if it's cool, I was burnt out. So after Sony Music, then Much Music, music became business. Like when I was at Much, I was going out to concerts four to five times a week. And while that sounds like really cool and fun, I was losing my voice. I was exhausted. It was on top of a full day of work. Some of the artists I was interested in, others it was because I was going to be interviewing them. So, so much of like my social life felt like work. So I actually took a break from discovering music for a while and just got into like other types of art forms. And I have really come back to music, especially in this moment, because I need hope, right? Like uh, I, I need energy. I, uh, I need to know that like we're going to be okay and music can really change your mood right and and I've been very dependent on that I'm also a dancer so I, I look to music for learning choreography and, and moving throughout my condo um, so I'm very thankful to music in this in this moment and I really hope that everyone right now is seeing the value of, of artists in times of crisis like this is what art does right it shows us the path Absolutely. And maybe you can show some of your dance moves later on maybe, as we maybe. wind down. So get ready. <laughs> um, so we're going to move from music and we're going to talk about art now. So you're going to show some of your art. I'm going to show some of, um, of my art. Let's start with you. Can you take us on yeah, a tour of your so art collection? See, like even in my background, I find when I have a lot of work meetings, often, you know, partners or people I'm meeting with will say like, oh, I like your art. And I'm really into colors. Like you can see it even what I wear. I mean, like there's I just, I love color, right? I figure like, I wore enough black for many years. Like, let, let's, let's introduce color. So I'll sh share with you some of my, my, my favorite pieces. So this, this is definitely my favorite. These are two original paintings by Lido Pimienta. And most people know Lida as a music artist and her big Polaris music prize win. 
but she is multimedia artist. And I was able to purchase these from her directly in her studio a few years ago. And I'm just constantly staring into the many, the many eyes and, and getting lost. So that's definitely my favorite piece. And it's right here, it's right in front of, of my couch. So I'm constantly looking to that. And then this, this other piece, which was behind me here, I got this when I was in Kenya. I mentioned that I had been to Dadaab, the refugee camp. So when I spent some time in, in East Africa, uh, freelancing, and this is by an artist, Otenio Kota. It's called Mama Ghetto. And he's an artist who lives in Kibera, which is one of the largest slums in, in Africa. It's really beautiful because if you look at the dress, you actually see Kibera, you see the slum community and how people are working together and forming community and doing all types of things. So I love that piece because again, you can just look into it and, and always discover something new. I also love when I can getting pieces that remind me of moments in time or memories. And I have another piece that does that. So this is a much smaller piece, it's down here. And yes, I have a Wonder Woman doll. But this piece here, this is by Tony Taylor. I'm gonna get down a little bit there. Tony Taylor Art. And it's the debate from the 2015 federal election. And that's the year I ran for office. So what Tony does is he takes animals and basically picks animals and turns them into politicians. So those are all the federal leaders as animals. And part of the reason his art's so small is because it's about politics and systems and he's often critiquing capitalism. He wants to make sure it's accessible and that everyone can buy it. So I love that. I normally have it on my desk at work and I'll bring it to the walrus with me. Oh, I have to show you this one, Erin. This is one of my favorite artists. So this here, this is a pillow and it's by an artist named Priya Lewick. She happens to be my niece. She was five years old when she did this. And I share it because my sister and I loved it so much, they turned it into a pillow for me. And it's very basquet, very much so. And it's a self-portrait. Super so that, fun. That picture of herself, and I just love it. Like it's, it's a pillow for me. And she lives in New Mexico with my sister and their family. And every time I talk to her, I get to show her the pillow and feel very connected to her. And I'll, I'll share one more piece. So I mentioned my, my background in dance. And for many years, I was in a break dance crew. And uh, it was an, just like such a special time. And our crew performed with Beastie Boys, with Nelly Furtado. And a street artist named Eager did this, this piece, which is a portrait of the crew. And it just brings back so many great memories. And I, I love that it captures the colors and energy and mood of city streets. And especially now when we can't spend as much time as we like on the streets. That I is look to super art for cool. those memories. That's amazing. And uh, break dancing with the Beastie Boys. That your your <laughs> yeah. cool life factor is like, sure. like off the charts. <laughs> um, now, now I want to ask you because again, you have this right now. This is the real thing, right? Like you're in the AGO. Here I am. Art that you can show me. Yes. That must be just the cool part of your job is just being around art all the time. It's totally cool. And I think folks were a little nervous about letting me loose through the galleries. I'm not a curator and I'm not a conservator. So I brought in three objects that, uh, that I love from, from our home. And I'm just going to show them to you. So the first one. Oh, yeah. You can, you can see that. Well, you know I love colors now. So I'm already. Yeah, yeah. Totally. This is by an artist named Cliff Island who sadly just passed away on the weekend. He was born in Nova Scotia and lived most of his life in Winnipeg. He was, loved libraries as a young boy and young man and was inspired to do these um, old library file card size paintings. And this obviously depicts, um, you know, books on a shelf. And he is, we've had his work here, he's exhibited internationally, but he's probably most well known for providing incredible installations in the Winnipeg Millennial Library and the Halifax Library. He, I think in Halifax, he did about 5,000 of these small paintings. Wow. And in Winnipeg, he did about a thousand. So just having a background in publishing and love reading, I, I really love this small work by, by Cliff. But it also looks like when you open up a computer, there's something about it where I see the bits and pieces, even though I also know I'm looking at a shelf. Totally. Yeah. And I purchased this from Catherine Mulherin, who was an amazing dealer in the city, 
who I've purchased a number of works from, who, who also unfortunately passed away last year. So we, we miss her presence a lot in the city. Um, this is a super cool work, which is by Dory Millerson. Oh, you wow. See that? It is basically a boat made out of thread. So I love this because movement. it just speaks to, you know, how creative artists are actually making something out of a piece of thread. Um, I love boats and I love water. Um, and she is a professor next door at OCAD U. So um, just, you know, neighborhood. trying to support some local artists. Um, finally, um, this is a horse. Um, farm animals are my people, Jennifer. I, mean, I, I really relate to farm animals. He, Joe Fafard is known for cows, horses, and people. Um, I don't know if you've been to the National Gallery of Canada recently, but at the entrance to the National Gallery is a huge sculpture of about 20 or so running horses like this in life size which is just incredible. And I just have a thing for horses. I think they're beautiful and amazing and majestic. And I purchased this from, the, from Art Toronto, which is Toronto's largest art fair. It's held every fall. And there are dealers from Canada and around the world who come to Toronto. And um, the opening event is always a benefit for the AGO. And so we really appreciate everyone's support who participates in the in the Art Toronto opening. I can hear the galloping, like it captures it so well, I can hear the galloping. Love it, love it, I love my art. So um, I just wanna make sure that we have time for a few more questions, because sure. it's 430, where did the time go? <laughs> well, this, this is the, the power of storytelling and art. Here we go. Often it's so easily, yeah. Um, do you wanna ask some or should I ask some, do you think? Let's see, yeah, what, what do we got in here? All right. Um, well, I want to ask you one here. There's okay. a question about what do you listen in music to be inspired? I'm curious, is there any music you're listening to right now to be inspired? Okay, well, this might surprise people, but um, I actually really enjoy listening to rap music. I find it very relaxing. Uh, my partner listens to like serious heavy metal, which drives me insane. Um, I just find, you know, Drake and all of the rap artists just very, very relaxing. But I have broad eclectic tastes. So Blue Rodeo was, uh, did the Lost Together thing last weekend. Yeah, it's been um, Just, you know, love the, love the Toronto music scene. There just are so, a, a plethora of musicians that I, that I absolutely love. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I find I've uh, really been going back into some of the, the retro picks, so 70s, 80s but also listening to uh, radio, both traditional radio and Apple radio to discover new music. Cool. Um, someone just asked a question about what magazines my dog likes. She <laughs> also likes to tear apart Toronto Life uh, and Canadian Art and Vanity Fair. So there you go. So I'm constantly Amazing. replenishing magazines. Amazing. Someone had asked if I could say the podcast name again for uh, The Walrus. It's called The Conversation Piece. So you can find that anywhere you get podcasts or at thewalrus.ca. Cool. And there's a question about how far in advance do you work on an issue and how quickly can you, can you pivot? Like, do you have to make changes just before you go to press ever? That yeah, never happens, it, right? We are in this. Like, that, that, is, that is the, like, all of the above answer. So while you were holding in your hand the issue that still at newsstands, this one here, right? Yep. So this is, this is May, this is June, and we're already wrapping up for July, August. That's for print, but we're constantly publishing new pieces of journalism online at thewalrus.ca. And some of those are pieces that you also find in the print publication. Uh, others are ones that you're just gonna find at thewalrus.ca. Uh, so we're always working ahead and thinking ahead, but also being in the moment. Yep, good. Um, we have time for, I think, one last question, and I'd like to take this one. Do Canadian Quebec and Canadian Quebec Indigenous Inuit and Meti artists get the global recognition they merit? And I'm asking that because I know that um, the Walrus regularly features many, many um, Indigenous voices. Um, so maybe you could comment on that quickly. Yeah, sure. We actually have an Indigenous storytelling series coming up. 
and I encourage everyone to look for that. It's going to be coming out in June, end of June. Uh, and I think there's just so much more work that we can do uh, on our path, individual paths to reconciliation. So while I think that um, Indigenous and, and also specifically Quebec and Canadian artists are getting more and more recognition, thanks to the work that lots of different institutions are doing, be it the AGO or the Walrus, um, and also social media, right? Artists on their own are getting their work out and telling their stories and their own voices, which is incredibly powerful. There's still a lot more work to do because of the systemic barriers in place. Absolutely. So just as we wrap up, I have to put on my walrus toque. Which, uh, <laughs> wow, you, you got it all. <laughs> right? I got my AGO shirt and my I, walrus I don't even toque. have one of those yet. Yeah. So I, I, I love my toque, but I, I would have to say I'd love some more merch. Jennifer. Okay, noted. Whatever you can do. Noted. Okay, I'd like a t-shirt and a baseball cap. And I love that I saw that you have a new tote bag coming out. So yeah, well, that's another thing is um, if, if you follow us on social media, we want to hear which tote bag you want. We've worked with an illustrator. We have three different designs and we're, we're actually asking our audience which tote bag they like. And art, art comes in many different, you know, many different packages and like tote bags, like a lot of art traveling across the city and in Canada on tote bags. I used my tote bag to carry in my artworks today. So it came in <laughs> handy. Yeah, um, yeah. Just one final quick question and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up. With print media funding models suffering in the midst of a pandemic, is the walrus evaluating how it works and exists? So maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, sure. That, that's definitely a conversation that was happening before I came on board. And it's something we're constantly talking about. Uh, what's so interesting about the walrus is we're a nonprofit media organization. So we have a diversity of revenue sources. So we welcome donations if anyone would like to donate to support our work in power of journalism. Uh, but we also have the walrus lab and the walrus talks. And I think that's something that has set us up very well for this time and beyond. Um, but I think right now all media organizations are, are constantly looking at, at funding models and just deeper engagement and relationship with audiences. Because that, that, that's what we're building on, which is, um, you know, growing towards a membership model. Absolutely. So um, great questions. Thank you so much for those who sent in questions. We, we really appreciate it. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to check out the walrus.ca. The walrus has lots of digital content and really go to the ago.ca website as well. We have regular content on an hourly daily basis while you're at home. There are lots of things you can learn about creating art. You can learn how to make tapas from our chef Renee. There's no end to the fun videos and, and um, things that you can see on ago.ca. I'll just, Plug for my I was going to say, if I can mention, for anyone who's interested in a print subscription, we do have a discount subscription available to AGO members to the Walrus. So uh, stay tuned. There'll be more details coming your way if you're a member. Do they get toques? Or that we, in maybe? time. In okay, time. Good. Um, if, they, if they want toques, they can buy toques. We have the Walrus store online at the Walrus. True. CA, so go, to the wall, go to the Walrus store. So just to plug my wonderful director and CEO, Stefan Yost who is doing talks every Thursday at four with some of our world's leading museum directors. So again, just be sure to check out ago.ca. Jennifer, thank you very much. I look forward to meeting you in person. I'm very excited about the walrus and the direction that you'll take it. And I'm confident that it's in very good hands. So that, that's it, everyone. Please stay safe and well, and we'll see you soon. Take care.